welcome uh, everyone uh, to, to this uh, to this uh, presentation to, to this uh, webinar. Uh, welcome to uh, all our uh, participants. We are happy you are there. Uh, there is a lot of you. We have over 170 participants to this uh, webinar, so we are very happy about this. And most of all, uh, welcome to our uh, great speakers. Uh, let me introduce to you Mr. Daniel Cantin from the European Commission, who is taking care of the policy uh, driving and governing uh, the Copernicus uh, program. And wel welcome to uh, Professor uh, Thomas Blaske from University of Salzburg, uh, who will be uh, um, uh, talking about the applications uh, and science, uh, scientific applications of uh, Earth observation data and uh, Earth observation dissemination platforms from the point of view of uh, its uh, use, its applications in, in the scientific domains. Uh, so, uh, starting with this, we will we will uh, go. Okay. So here is our agenda for today. First, we will um, uh, discuss the. I will introduce uh, the challenges fi facing um, Earth observation dissemination systems. What these systems are and what are the challenges they are uh, facing. Then uh, Daniel will uh, present the, uh, this dissemination systems from the point of view uh, of uh, the Copernicus uh, and Sentinel programs, uh, most of all, and from the point of view of the uh, European Commission. Commission. Then I will go back with some ways to uh, address these challenges and some best practices we have learned uh, and we have found while operating uh, big dissemination platforms for uh, big, big scale uh, data. And then uh, Thomas will uh, come with the challenges and the opportunities for scientists and end users in using and exploring uh, big data using uh, these platforms. We will wrap up with conclusions and a short Q&A session. Uh, we'll, we will uh, try to close it within an hour time. Uh, so, starting with these uh, challenges, what what these are. First, a few words about Cloudfero itself. We are a cloud operator specialized in, um, uh, in the Earth observation data processing sector. So we are running uh, a platform, uh, several platforms, uh, for uh, storing, disseminating, and processing uh, Earth observation data. Uh, we are a fully European company uh, with uh, with uh, all the European uh, origin and um, and uh, infrastructure and capital and everything uh, we uh, are concentrated on this uh, earth observation uh, sector but also uh, climate research science we we diverge a little bit uh, in uh, neighboring sectors, but this is the core of our uh, um, uh, activity. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, so uh, this is just a short introduction. We were not a very old company, but we've been uh, here for uh, over six years. Uh, and we mostly operate uh, big uh, data earth observation uh, clouds for several uh, um, uh, organizations and institutions, including, of, of course, Copernicus run projects such as EO Cloud, the, the Creodias, and Wikio. Uh, we also operate uh, a German uh, Earth observation platform, and our our uh, business is uh, is con continuously uh, growing um, as. All, the, all this sector is. Uh, so th this was about Cloudfero itself. Let's let's get down to the uh, 
subject of this uh, of this uh, presentation, we'll be talking about how to disseminate star process and disseminate uh, Earth observation uh, data. So, uh, as an intro introduction, let's see where this data comes from, how it is processed, how, how it arrives into, uh, how it reaches customers, what's the path for this data to go from satellite to the user. So first there is the observation satellite, which uh, takes some measurements, performs some onboard processing on these measurements. This can be more or less sophisticated dependent on, depending on the satellite. So either it could be a systematic acquisition satellite that transfers mostly everything it observes down to Earth, or, or it could be a, a task-based task satellite that receives some uh, uh, orders or tasks on what should be observed. There is some onboard processing of the, of the data. This data may be uh, initially cleaned. Sometimes the newer satellites may perform some uh, decisions on what data to, uh, using, for instance, artificial intelligence and other methods to decide what should be uh, acquired and what should not. And this uh, data acquisition, uh, this acquired data either is either transferred directly to a ground station. These ground sta stations tend to be um, located around the poles, uh, North Pole and uh, South Pole, because this is the place where the satellite uh, overflies uh, at every revolution, uh, these satellites, observation sa satellites, are mostly uh, polar uh, orbit satellites. Some satellites uh, go through a relay sa satellite, which is uh, which relays this data before it gets uh, to the ground, and this uh, extended path through a relay satellite allows for uh, faster. Uh, acquisition of the data. So uh, this uh, using this uh, method, the data may be acquired almost, uh, may be uh, transferred down to Earth almost immediately after it was um, observed. Uh, with a direct ground station, the satellite might overfly a certain ground station before it uh, downloads data down to the ground station. Then from this uh, ground station, the, uh, the data must go through, uh, through some processing, uh, which is uh, sometimes quite heavy. Sometimes it is delayed because it uh, requires some additional metadata or other information to be included before the final product is uh, generated. And then this uh, generated pr products of different levels may be uh, distributed to users. And all this data path is currently uh, is currently under heavy um, transformation. Uh, it used to be uh, very uh, silos-like with vertical uh, infrastructures processing data from a single mission. Uh, while now it is uh, being transformed uh, and it, it has mostly been transformed uh, into a cloud-based operation where different stages of this processing may be performed by uh, different cloud-based actors and all the data tends to be uh, available from uh, common sources for these satellites. So. Uh, with all this uh, ecosystem, uh, there are uh, different uh, there are different users and actors uh, involved in this system, uh, in this ecosystem, and uh, these uh, users have different um, uh, challenges uh, and different needs. So there are different needs for policymakers. So, uh, from the uh, point of view, first of all, I should start with users, who need the data. Who most mo most mostly they need the data. They um, they have different uh, platforms, clouds, and data sources from which they uh, can get this data. So this creates some uh, problems as they uh, need to switch between these data sources. 
um, there they have data consistency issues uh, that the data may not may or may not be uh, in the same scale uh, both temporal and spatial um, different instruments and they would like to have mostly coherent data there are different diverse access methods the download times reliability is also an issue because uh, users often need to uh, have this data uh, quickly and downloading the data in large volumes takes time over uh, over uh, narrow links Clouds and infrastructures have limited processing capabilities. Tools uh, are uh, different. Tools are available on different platforms, so this is not heterogeneous. This locks uh, users into one cloud uh, or one platform and uh, makes trans transition difficult. There is also complex data lic licensing issues. The issues of data providers are mostly concentrated on around growing data sizes all along the this path we have shown a growing number of data sets down long uh, downlink bandwidth which is limited they need to ways to reach customers of course data providers want to have uh, uh, as many customers and users as possible uh, and uh, while doing this they need to keep the costs reasonable from the policymakers and society point, point of view uh, what is important is strategic autonomy. This is especially important in uh, Europe to have to have um, uh, uh, to be strategically autonomous. Sustainability of the projects is an issue. Standardization is another issue that uh, these uh, data and user users uh, are able to interoperate uh, while supporting the development of the sectors policymakers need to uh, take care of market to keep the market competitive uh, to uh, level the fields for different players on the market to make it fair uh, and of course they want to promote the usage of these platforms so these are the challenges uh, now we uh, I will uh, switch the this presentation to uh, Daniel who will be um, talking about the uh, Copernicus point of view uh, about the Copernicus program uh, in the context of, of this big data and then we will talk about how we could address those challenges and how we do it in uh, our platforms Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your last slide was very interesting. I hear an echo. I hope it's going to go away. Yeah, your last slide was very interesting. And indeed, we could spend quite a lot of time in those because it's summarizing a lot of those uh, issues. Um, now, uh, I'll take a bit of a larger picture. Uh, what Sanislaw has presented was very much focused on the space, and indeed, this is where uh, the amount of data, the amount of data acquired and process is uh, the biggest. So, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, this Copernicus for those who do not know already. I will go a bit fast because I have quite a lot of slides, but then understand that you will receive them anyway. So. Um, this is the Copernicus. This is an environmental and security, more environmental uh, than security public service. Uh, we are using the data from uh, space. Uh, we have our own uh, Sentinel satellite, uh, but also other missions. We are using in situ data. We are distributing those. We are providing them to specific uh, services and then uh, both the Sentinel data and the information provided by the services are uh, distributed to users. This is the structure of the uh, Copernicus program where the program manager is in fact the European Commission, uh, but we are really relying on the expertise of international organization like ESA, of course, for technical coordination 
And then on ESA UMEDSAT for the operation of satellites, we are also acquiring other mission data from commercial provider. Then the central um, uh, part, which is the service part, we are also relying on specialized organisms in the different topic of those services. And we are also relying on in situ data because the services are provided mixing and using different source of data, both from in situ and from space. This is a, another picture that Stanislaw just presented to you as a ground segment. This is the ground segment uh, getting the data from the satellite. I will go uh, quickly uh, on that one that was uh, quite, quite well uh, uh, explained before. Of course, there is the full process for those data and provided to both the user on the free, full and open data policy and to uh, the uh, Copernicus services. The amount of data produced is quite, is quite important. We have also a lot of registered users. Uh, you see the figures in the green on your left hand side, uh, over 400,000 uh, registered users. A lot of data is uh, being downloaded and used by those users. There is uh, the green table show a ratio between the data produced, uh, one and then the uh, reuse, the, down, the downloaded and reuse of the data, uh, uh, the number there uh, are showing for the full um, archive. We have, those are the satellites uh, for the Copernicus program, the specific one, the dedicated one. We have eight satellites flying in orbit at the moment. We have radar system, we have optical system. We have the Sentinel-3, which has both instrument radar and optical, but at coarser resolution, the two other constellations. We have the uh, atmospheric chemistry um, with uh, Sentinel-5P, and then uh, we have uh, the Sentinel-6, uh, which is measuring the uh, eight of the uh, oceans. More satellites are coming already from this current uh, Sentinel constellation. You see on the, on the top, the arrow on the top, there's two other instruments with uh, Sentinel-5 and 4, which will come in the coming uh, two years. But we are preparing also for other um, uh, missions. They, we call them Sentinel expansion missions, uh, new type of uh, sensors, and also the continuation for post uh, uh, beyond 2030, the continuation of the current uh, Sentinel constellation, of course, with a new generation of uh, sensor to equip uh, those uh, satellites. For the first generation, we have foreseen four units uh, for Sentinel, uh, the constellation of Sentinel 1, 2, and 3. Um, and at the moment, we have the two first units flying, and they will be replaced by the unit C and then the unit D. So we already have for for also to be, we we can cover uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, surface for um, coming years. What matters, of course, is the, the continuity of the provision. We are establishing Copernicus for a long time to provide those uh, information to uh, the users. Those are the different uh, services. All of them are providing their own specific information in the thematic in which they are acting, land, marine, atmosphere, climate change as well. And then they have two specific services which are acting on demand, which is the emergency management for man-made of natural disaster, and then the specific security services. Those two are consuming usually data from higher resolution, hence commercial uh, providers, but also using the uh, Sentinel um, as, um, as input data, depending on the resolution they need. What's interesting to see is that even 
the satellite uh, data, the way it is acquired and processed, control for the quality, archive, disseminated, and then exploited, all through the user need, because Copernicus is a user-driven system, we are really putting a lot of emphasis on the user need. The same data life cycle would work as well for the different services. It would be ingestion of the data, processing, quality control, archiving, dissemination, exploitation. That means that there is a, a lot of those process throughout Copernicus um, uh, replicated for different need and purposes. But of course, we would be looking at system which would be helping the two blue uh, 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 boxer, the dissemination and the exploitation. Lots of uh, information, lots of data coming from uh, different places. We know now that there are the, uh, the ICT, the information technology uh, system in place. We look at the cross fertilization of both earth observation and ICT to better uh, provide services to our users. And for this, we came with the concept of the DIAS, where there's a system taking on board the data, putting it in the cloud, and then providing service to the user there. Uh, those are OGC uh, standard services or Inspire uh, standard services for the user and plus the uh, API. So that uh, this is basically the, 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 the concept of, of the DIAS, uh, to create an ecosystem on top of those uh, data lake. Uh, we have five of those uh, DIASs. Those are the DIAS, Creo DIAS, Mundi, Onda, Wikio, and SoBlue. Different DIAS having different uh, technology and way to address the user. They are quite autonomous in their acts uh, because there is one part which are the services uh, required um, by, by us. And then there's all the possibility for those DSs to develop their own uh, services to the uh, user, of course, investing their own uh, money to do so. And the idea is to be able to chain different uh, uh, services from third party that would come on top of the DIAS and build this Earth observation ecosystem. So the DIAS are responding to a baseline uh, request and then adding uh, uh, other data. We have asked for the Copernicus data information to be stored, but the DIAS can store other data, data of the user or the data they would like to uh, present. They can, of course, provide other services, and this is needed because there is always an evolution in the uh, technology provided to the users. When you are looking at this technological trend, we, we see after having established those DIASs that we still have uh, the full Copernicus system and then those DIASs. Um, Stanislaw has been talking about the modernization of the uh, ground segment, the transformation project, where progressively there is a cloudification of those. Uh, infrastructure, specific Copernicus infrastructure. And the same is true also for the other services. So there is no a convergence between the uh, service that is needed to provide information to the user, to provide the information, uh, uh, the data uh, to the user, and the dissemination exploitation. And so we see now we are reflecting a lot on the integrated data management concept, looking inside Copernicus for those infrastructure, cloud-based, but also uh, looking at HPC for uh, the modernization, of course, of the uh, Copernicus information services, but also looking towards the user, uh, connecting also and looking at national infra infrastructure, which are using the Copernicus uh, data, the research world and, and businesses. So um, this is a, a, a work that needs uh, uh, to, uh, to be done. And uh, we are very much looking at 
the new services that industry is able to uh, provide to Copernicus to be able to cross fertilize, as I said, Earth observation with ICT technology and also looking beyond Earth observation to the other data sets because we know that mixing Earth observation data with other data are creating a lot of value for the user and the possibility to have innovation and new services. Thank you very much. This concludes my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, for for this great uh, overview of uh, of the um, uh, Copernicus uh, data processing and dissemination. And uh, we will follow up with uh, with our we we have uh, I have talked a little bit about the challenges uh, around this three communities that uh, the ecosystem is addressing. Uh, and um, while we don't have a very systematic uh, way of addressing all these challenges, uh, through our operation of the um, of different dias, and not only dias, but uh, different um, uh, Earth observation data processing platforms, we have found some uh, um, ways and uh, some uh, ideas on uh, what is uh, what works well on such platforms, what attracts users, what is useful for users, what addresses uh, at least some of the challenges we have presented, and what are the ways uh, of um, going forward into addressing these uh, challenges. So. Uh, we have built uh, and operated um, uh, a few of these platforms. There is uh, Creodias, where we are the, um, uh, the builder and provider of that platform. We also participate in the consortium um, running uh, Wikio platform. We, uh, before Wikio and Creodias, we have created EO Cloud, which was uh, kind of uh, a kind of precursor to the Dias idea on a smaller scale. Uh, we are also operating uh, Code D for um, for DLR uh, and uh, also CDS, the CDS uh, platform for the European Center of Medium and Weather Forecasts is also running on our uh, infrastructure. Uh, First of all, uh, through the use of these different platforms, we have found that users have there are a few distinct distinct ways for users of using these platforms. There are some users who just want to browse and view the data that is there and find things on it, and these users require easy, um, uh, easy, easy to use tools and a broad range of data. Uh, then there are users who want to download uh, this data and process it locally. This is old way to. Uh, this is the old way to go, that you uh, download the data to your uh, infrastructure and process it uh, within your infrastructure. This is uh, uh, an approach that is traditional, and still many users are uh, are using it, and that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, more m more modern way of doing things is with cloudification, as Daniel uh, has uh, rightly pointed it, where we, uh, instead of bringing uh, data to the users, it makes more sense to bring users to the data. Uh, I don't ma mean that uh, data is bigger than the users, uh, but uh, at least at least it's um, uh, it's easier to process the data uh, and do things with it uh, close to the the data because this data is very voluminous we are talking about petabytes of data here so uh, transferring petabytes of data is not an easy task even uh, considering uh, current bandwidth so there is processing in the cloud uh, this this can be processed. Some users process it using classical IIS infrastructures. Uh, by IIS, we mean that users have virtual environments with uh, 
with uh, virtual machines or uh, vi virtual infrastructure uh, as a service and they deploy their own application to process the data within this infrastructure level service uh, with close close access to uh, and uh, easy close access to the this data lake and that is um, the processing uh, user some users and this is a very interesting model that many users uh, appreciate having predefined processes that are that are uh, predefined and that they, they can run at scale in the cloud so these are the basic consumption models so from this consumption models there are, uh, the, we will switch to the uh, users using those models uh, uh, tend to have some issues and some things working for them uh, and uh, we have uh, through our oper operation of the platforms we have found that some practices are uh, beneficial for users and work well within the platform they are also beneficial of course for the operator of such a platform such as we are and they uh, we, we generally have a few recommendations i would say while running such platforms so uh, we have a, a few of these recommendations and i will discuss them uh, in in the next few slides so uh, First of all, we have made some, uh, it makes sense to calculate, uh, uh, to, to, in order to decide, it, it makes sense to calculate and to estimate things. And we made uh, an interesting ins um, estimation comparing uh, the costs of uh, satellite mission and what it costs to acquire a data product, then what it costs to download it, uh, downlink it to, to Earth, and what, what it costs to process it and what it costs to store it. And we have found that the cost of uh, processing and storage is relatively low compared to the cost of acquiring a satellite product. The calculation we have made here is for Sentinel-1 A and B. Roughly the budget of this project was uh, around 400 uh, million euros. Um, Assuming these satellites will uh, would be operating over 10 years period, which is quite a, uh, an aggressive, I would say, um, assumption, though, though perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, reasonable. Uh, and the number of products generated each year, uh, we come down to a cost of uh, this should uh, this is misspelled it's, it, it shouldn't be a cost of acquiring one product it, it, it's the cost of it's the um, cost of the mission divided by the number of products it, this mission generates so uh, in these terms the cost of one product is 91 uh, euros uh, which is to be compared to the cost of downlinking a product. This, this is an estimate based on uh, the cost of uh, an, uh, an Amazon surface for downlinking because this, this was the easily available uh, cost estimate. It, it may, of course, vary. But to downlink this uh, 1.3 gigabyte of data roughly costs three, uh, 3 euros. Then to process Assuming the processing of, of such a product could cost uh, uh, one hour of processing using a, quite a, a large virtual machine, this would cost 90 uh, euro cents. The cost of storage, storing this data over one year is just 16 euro cents. And the cost of 10 years storage considering the degressive costs of storage, uh, the, this degression of 30% per year is what we have seen over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, comparing the costs of storage. Uh, this storage uh, over 10 years would cost just uh, under one euro. So the conclusion of this is that the cost of generating, um, uh, of acquiring a, a product is quite high compared to the costs of processing it and storing it. So once you uh, have uh, acquired a product, you'd better keep it. It makes sense to keep it. 
And even once you have generated a product, it still makes sense to keep it uh, as long as there is a chance somebody will use it. And on this usage uh, of the products, uh, I really like Daniel's slide uh, on this, uh, on the things uh, that we should be doing in order to uh, boost usage and to, uh, to boost acquisition, to, to boost usage and applications of the product. And the issue for many users, uh, users will never, never use the product if it's not there. Uh, they will have no chance to use it. Uh, and uh, if they are to generate this product, it uh, creates uh, a few um, issues. First of all, they need to have the, all the, both the software and infrastructure ne necessary to generate a higher level product uh, from lo lower level data. Then they, they need to finance it. And uh, only at the end, they will be able to use it. The, and for many product categories, is, it makes perfect sense to pre-generate this product because it boosts usage of the base product that was downloaded, effectively reducing the cost, the cost of uh, acquiring one, uh, one product in terms of the mission cost. Yes, so, so to uh, to rentabilize, I, I don't know if there is such a word, to make the um, mission pay off, it makes sense to generate a lot of high quality, higher level products that users will use because it reduces the per product cost uh, of the mission. So this is one interesting finding and this comparison I think is, is uh, interesting. Uh, of course, it all depends. This is a slide uh, we have borrowed from the from the Copernicus uh, um, uh, uh, technical operational budget, uh, it, it explains how an acquired product translates into higher level product. The sizes of these products may of, of course vary, but the general idea that was presented on the, on the previous slide uh, we think is, is valid regardless of whether the, this generated product is uh, Fifty percent or twice bigger. So I was with this uh, this uh, flow of Copernicus uh, Sentinel uh, data, but this just il illustrates uh, the, um, uh, the what was shown on the, on the previous uh, slide, and this holds valid for many many use cases. Though of course not for all, it, it doesn't make sense to pre-generate everything. This is obvious. Okay, so the se second finding is that uh, it makes sense to distribute data in uh, standard, easily accessible formats. Uh, so this is uh, these formats are OGC-based uh, standards uh, for uh, tiled data, uh, object access or file system uh, access uh, for raw data. Uh, we think it makes perfect sense to uh, store data in uh, uncompressed formats uh, to make it available for uh, users easily and directly so that, that in order to process the data, they don't need to go through the download, copy, decompress cycle. Uh, so this is important. Uh, the data cubes that uh, Daniel uh, mentioned, I think, if, no, it, it was not Daniel, it is in, uh, I think, in Thomas' uh, presentation, yes. There will be data cubes. Uh, I, we think it's a perfect format for uh, for uh, keeping and distributing um, the data, making it available to users. So things like the ZAR format for uh, for data cubes are perfect for um, multi-dimensional data cubes. It makes the use of special libraries optional. Um, uh, users shouldn't be forced to use a very special exotic library that they don't want to use. Data should be as readily available as possible. A fast homogeneous catalog tool uh, uh, available through an API and through a, a user inter a graphical user interface is also very valuable to in order to find the proper data quickly. So this is about data 
access. Then the next thing that we found is uh, crucial for users is to have enough bandwidth and processing power. So uh, in order to run such an infrastructure, this is big data. You, you need uh, carrier grades, scalable, redundant internet access. This, this is obvious. You need storage at the tens of petabyte scale that is redundant, reliable at this scale and uh, provides the bandwidth necessary to uh, do the processing. This is very often very IO intensive uh, business. Uh, then the processing power is also necessary to in order to to enable easy repeatable uh, large scale product generation when these products need to be generated uh, on demand. Uh, so running such a processing campaign quickly is uh, important. We think it makes sense to pre-generate useful data sets upfront to boost their usage, as, as was shown on the, on the previous um, uh, reasoning. Uh, and uh, another finding about bandwidth is that uh, the infrastructure you build should avoid multi-step pipeline, pipelines and bottlenecks because these just don't scale. They, they, uh, such pipelines uh, often become uh, bottlenecks in the system. Uh, and even with very fast infrastructure, if the architecture is not right, uh, this slowed, slows down all the, uh, the system. Uh, this is uh, uh, regarding the data sizes. This is where uh, in the left column you see the estimates from the technical budget of Copernicus where what sizes of storage and dissemination uh, we are currently seeing or will be seeing very uh, in a very near future. And on the right side, you see where we stand uh, currently with the current infrastructure we have. So, uh, so uh, we are quite compatible with the, uh, with the estimates uh, for uh, the next years of Copernicus, we have uh, even tested the platform uh, as being able to um, to process two petabytes of uh, data, to deliver, to disseminate two petabytes of data per day. So this is just an illustration. Next recommendation or next finding we have is that it makes perfect sense to uh, federate both users and data access. Uh, users often need to combine data sets from different sources. Uh, considering the data sizes, these petabytes of data, uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, keep too many copies of the data because it gets too expensive. You need, of course, a few copies for redundancy, but no more than that. And then you should federate uh, user access uh, and access to the data. Uh, to provide users with transparent access uh, to a large number of data sets. And we do these things uh, in a few manners and in a few models. Uh, first of all, we, um, we, for instance, we provide on the platforms we run, we provide access to external data sets, some of them commercial, some of them not commercial that can be ordered by the user and delivered to the platform uh, within a few hours. Uh, of course, de depending on the size of the, of the uh, order uh, and then used as any other data sets on the platform. Then we have platforms like CodeD, for instance, that uses uh, some of its local uh, own data sets but also has a way to access the um, uh, data sets of uh, Copernicus, uh, which are stored in, uh, in another uh, technical infrastructure. So, so uh, uh, doing such, uh, such uh, feder federative uh, moves can uh, boost access to, to data, can boost uh, the e effectiveness of its uh, use. Of course, all of this through, should happen through homogeneous uh, interfaces. Uh, the next recommendation is to use and contribute to open source projects. This is our strategy of doing these uh, things and we think it makes perfect sense both being a user and contrib contributing to uh, such projects. 
uh, we think that uh, it, it's a good and fair way to, to uh, develop the business and profitable. And the last last thing is about energy and resources. I think it's uh, it's an important one. It's um, the good news is that energy efficiency uh, often translates in cost efficiency. Not always, but often. This famous green premium that uh, many people are talking about happens to be uh, low or uh, even negative in um, in uh, many cases. By green premium, we, we mean the delta you have to pay in order to make your solution more green. Uh, and sometimes making it more green trans translates into better cost efficiency. So we have a few examples of these. First of all, use effective storage, large hard drives, uh, use erasure coding, which is a wise encoding, uh, data encoding method that allows you to keep uh, multiple copies of the data without multiplying the size of this data by as many copies as, as you have. So uh, th th this is a very good method of reducing the costs of uh, storage. Compression is al also another would think, though it needs to be balanced, uh, we, for instance, use block level compression, which allows you to have compressed data while uh, providing this data uh, in a transparent way to the user. So he doesn't need to decompress it in order to access it. Decompression happens on read of the data automatically. Cold storage is also uh, a good thing to re reduce the storage costs. Energy efficient computing, this is uh, this is quite obvious, uh, uh, but there are other things you can do. If you can, and this is uh, something that we like doing, optimize over the whole technology stack. We like to keep uh, a whole technology st stack from the bare metal to uh, the software uh, to have comp competency across this whole stack and to be able to tweak things across this whole stack because it allows you to optimize across the whole stack and it works perfectly well for us. Another thing is to optimize on hardware, uh, both on configuring this hardware, which uh, if you, if you uh, manage the whole stack, you are able to do this sort of, sort of thing. Not, not uh, we try to avoid pre-built con configurations that we cannot uh, manage and tweak. And we tend to keep, this is something that is, I think, uh, quite important uh, from the sustainability uh, point of view. We like to keep uh, selected hardware uh, parts for a long time. For instance, things like, uh, like uh, metal cases, server cases, or uh, power supplies. Uh, to a certain extent, processors have quite a long lifetime and the evolution uh, of technology in these areas are much, uh, is much slower than the marketing uh, uh, story from hardware vendors um, uh, tries us to believe. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in some cases, you need to use the most modern and newer, newest things, uh, technology that appears and you need to switch it quickly. But with many component, it makes, components, it makes sense to keep them for uh, four, five, six, seven years. Uh, and it works uh, perfectly well, saving on both the nature footprint and uh, costs. Uh, and uh, another finding that is uh, especially valuable uh, with uh, with uh, processing types that are offline, which is which is that are type of batch or workflow based processing, which which are a large part of what uh, we are talking about here, that uh, we can make better use of uh, of uh, renewables uh, if we can delay. Uh, slightly delay the processing to the time when this uh, energy or uh, processing power may be uh, more available than uh, in the peak time, uh, cheaper or uh, more green than in peak time. Yes. 
So this is uh, our last uh, finding here. And I would uh, switch to uh, Thomas uh, for the continuation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to be fast, hopefully not too fast, uh, to save some time. So maybe it using less than 15 minutes before people have to leave uh, for the hour. So my name is Thomas Blaschke. I'm with the University of Salzburg Department of Geoinformatics. And uh, I will, I want to, um, sorry, that's too fast. Just reorganizing my slides here. Maybe just just uh, looking backward one with one slide, where did we come from? The situation in the late 90s. And this was a very visionary talk by uh, that, the pres at that present time president, Vice President Al Gore, who's catched the vision of a digital Earth, you know, where I said like every child should be able, you know, to touch on a virtual 3D screen and, and zoom in, zoom out seamlessly. And I mean, nowadays it doesn't sound so spooky because technology is there, but at that time it wasn't. And this is how, how um, certain developments started. There was some political movement then that ended up in um, creating the International Society of Digital Earth. Um, both through some American initiative initially, and then the uh, China putting in quite some resources through the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so I just make a little advertisement that in two weeks time, we will host the 12th International Symposium on Digital Earth. You can still register. There is a relatively cheap online uh, only registration. Just just check out. I can, I can put the URL in the chat. Um, and, and there will be very interesting sub-events, like one being uh, organized by ESA together with the European Commission on Destination Earth and like the European way of implementing implementation beyond the idea, the concept, uh, uh, the, the, the metaphor of a digital Earth. And there will be also other sub-events telling what's the situation in Africa, what's the situation in the Americas, talking about as also geo involved. Uh, so if you have time, join us uh, in two weeks from now for this international symposium. Um, it is important because um, nowadays it's, <laughs> as Stanislav pointed out, there is a lot of technology behind and you need to know about OGC standards. You need probably need to understand uh, what the, uh, you know, WMF and, and uh, what, what, whatever these, whatever behind, whatever feature services, uh, whatever are behind. But there's also so many political programs that are nowadays dependent on the data. And I just put here exemplarily, I just put a, a few abbreviations, and that's only from the GEO, and GEO is one political framework, obviously. Um, and maybe you, you're probably not aware of all those programs. And all those programs have some monitoring tasks that need Earth observation plus in situ information um, urgently. And today, I, I claim, and I will, I will also in this conference that I mentioned, I will talk about that a little more. There is something like a silent revolution. Others, others call it a data explore, um, explosion. Stanislav already, or I think Daniel already showed some slides, and I think I have, I have one slide about that. But how did how did it happen? I mean, you know, um, the it's not only the couple of hundred Earth observation satellites being launched by ESA, NASA, JAXA, etc. But there is now there is really private industry taking over through the movement through in, in, in small sats, uh, nano, nano, so small sats like flying washing machines, if you wish, um, uh, nano sats stuff less than 10 kilograms, say, uh, cube sats, very standardized, uh, 1.3 kilogram, um, small gadgets that you see here, 
But they're no, but they're more than gadgets because there are so many of them, and they can build larger risk-tolerant disaggregated sensor networks you, to collect images and, and not only images, measurements of, Earth, of, of, of atmosphere quality every day. So this 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 all comes together based on lower costs for the launchers through some what is maybe called the sharing economy launches that you don't necessarily have to have your own launcher but you can you can carry many of them so we see this this private sector um, movement there's uh, a lot going on some talk about democratization of space but um, I doubt a little bit if this is all uh, if this is really true but there's not enough time to go into that um, but the second kind of revolution, and that has already been touched upon, sorry, that was the wrong slide, uh, is this increase of data. That's, that's not the newest slide, that's one I borrowed from Maurice Bourgeau, uh, but there are, there are newer ones. But actually, you, it's, it's, only about, it's only about the steepness of the graph, it's not about the figures. It is, um, I mean, some years ago we thought that Landsat is, is huge data, but it's not. <laughs> As Sentinel and and in future other missions, that's that's what we call big data. But maybe in ten years from now, people will love it. will say, "Oh, this was small data." You know, this is so. I mean, this is all a movement. Uh, this is, uh, but you know what I'm talking about. And that that is now. This is bringing this these other these these big changes. And this is really a paradigm shift. Um, I refer here to a paper that I cite on one of the next slides by Martin Suttmans, my colleague, and, and, and a couple of other colleagues from the University of Salzburg, where we claim like a, a paradigm shift. It doesn't make sense anymore. Like in the old days, you went to a library and you borrowed a book or you copied something out of a book and then you, you have it on your desk. Nobody can take it away. And, and later on, you, you try to get satellite data. And once they started to download, to make them available for FTP downloaders, or you downloaded the data. But nowadays, like in the library, that it doesn't make sense to store every single PDF. Uh, it doesn't make sense to store every single um, every single image on your on your screen. So bring the users into the cloud, kind of, and and that's and not only access and visualize, but but start. The, the the processing, the analyzing of images and increasingly GIS data in the cloud. That's that's the clear uh, that's the clear message here. And so this is the paper here. I'm referring to uh, 2020 paper in the International Journal of Digital Earth. If you have a little time, I recommend uh, this to read. So there are, and we saw already. I have to I have to be quick here. There, there are obviously approaches to big Earth observation data. They're di in Europe. <laughs> we had, we know these dias concepts. Also, I personally never understood why we need to have five dias systems, but that's another story. Uh, there's Google Earth Engine. That's like a, I call it a brute force um, mechanism. Uh, to me, it's not a very intelligent system, but if you have enough computing power, it really works, right? Um, uh, Amazon now uh, can becoming a big player in this in, uh, um, in this market. But to me, and this is something I want to point out here, a quite intelligent uh, solution is um, let me, yeah, quite intelligent solution are are um, data cubes. Again, I I refer for time reasons I refer uh, to this paper. So data cubes, interestingly, the array databases behind, they are not, not really new. I mean, Rusterman, <laughs> they, uh, Peter Baumann always says that he, he started his work in 1998 with a, is a functioning array database. But for any reason, it only became popular um, a few years, uh, days ago. And I think the reason being is, is, is the huge amount of data. But I think what's, what's the future, or what we are working at the university, at because that's our task to not not stop with existing technology, but try to go to go on. Um, this is where my colleagues, um, the, the working group of Dirk Tide, Martin Suttmans, and others, they they're working on a semantic data cubes by ingesting data in a certain way 
that you can um, set up queries that would allow you to retrieve certain areas based on you're, you're looking for land use, land cover, or you're looking for islands. And this is something that you cannot do on, based on pixel because a pixel will never know that it's an island. It needs to become an object uh, virtually or on the fly or whatever. And then uh, we, we enter there's something where I many years ago have been working in a field called object based image analysis. We, we, we need to start to group pixels to make them somehow intelligence or to let them know about their environment to put them in context. And, and so semantic data cubes as here with a just maybe want to check out this the center cube uh, project or you refer to this this one arti short article here published in a journal just called data. Um, I think I think you will see what I'm you want to do that uh, you will see what I what I mean with by that. So and then again I'm I'm in a rush a little bit now. Uh, so th so the future is geo AI, isn't it? Machine learning everything will David it will do for us. Well, I mean yes that's, that's a future. Yes, there is a very there are very interesting uh, things going on. No question. Um, but um, I, I, I doubt a little bit that it will solve everything. Let me try to find the next slide. Here we go. Yeah. Um, I was involved in, a, in an article um, where we compared around 20 different, for the same, the same case, we used uh, 20 different versions of CNNs. Um, and compared it to uh, support vector machine classification, random forest classification. And interestingly, only one version of it outperformed uh, support vector machine, etc. And so most researchers, obviously in, in computer vision, so they would actually go for the one for the one uh, version that is um, that outperforms the others. But our problem somehow is that we can't explain why using three layers uh, or why choosing five by five uh, uh, convolution etc uh, led to that uh, to that result so this is something um, just an example that that we um, that yes there is there is this this big potential with AI and machine learning but there is a need for and this is probably our role there's still a need for academia to steer such a process, to ask the right questions, to be able to, um, well, to, to uh, get insightful um, results to, to help to understand the world. And, and as, a, as my conclusion slide, I make again some a little advertisement. We have this, this, uh, three universities in, in Salzburg and Austria, in France, and in the Czech Republic, we're running an we um, a European master's program, a Copernicus master in digital earth, where students uh, exactly learn that. And they are really, these, these are the workforce, they are the workforce of the future. And, and we always ask um, to produce more of those students, but we have, at the moment, we have 16 fully funded um, students funded by the European Commission per year. But there's also, if somebody's interested, room for industry to sponsor some of those students and to uh, have a work for us later. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to tell you a little bit and sorry for the rush to stay in time. Thank you very much back to the organizer. Okay, thank you, Thomas, for uh, for this uh, presentation. We will uh, go, uh, as we are a bit late, we will go very quickly to the conclusions. These are very generic conclusions we have drafted that generally, we see the data is growing in both size and variety. This is quite obvious. Uh, another conclusion is that data availability drives usage, yes? Uh, and it creates the industry as, uh, and it goes from the satellite to uh, through all the, through all the, uh, stops uh, in, in between. Uh, when the data is uh, there, it is available. Scientists and other users make can make uh, things with it, which is also quite obvious. 
there are a lot of new challenges with digital earth with um, simulations with uh, monitoring uh, many new applications that need the data that need the processing that need the the technology uh, happily uh, the technology is here with this cloudification uh, model becoming omnipresent and this is also a good thing it opens up the whole system to new players it it uh, opens new possibilities uh, and uh, of course out of this uh, possibilities come new things new uh, storage new processing analysis uh, artificial intelligence visualizations n many different new methods and technologies that will bring uh, new data, uh, Earth observation data applications that can do new things that we cannot uh, just right now imagine. Uh, so this would be uh, as the conclusion. Uh, I would uh, just quickly ask Daniel and Thomas, do you, uh, would you like to add something to these conclusions? No, very briefly. Uh, thank you. I mean, we see we see the challenge. This is very interesting to see uh, the science world uh, coming uh, with innovation, with uh, analysis, with uh, a new way of uh, extracting information uh, out of the data. The uh, ICT world information technology uh, being able to sustain with new technology those analysis effort and also with. Uh, the Copernicus program, the assurance that there will be a flow of uh, data. We, we are multi-year programming and uh, of course for the next uh, seven years, uh, the uh, budget for um, having those data from Copernicus and preparing for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, maybe, maybe just adding here. Um, I, well, I also try to, to 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 get a message across, and maybe to re-emphasize is that um, the good news is that if a scientist is is interested in in um, a certain phenomena in the world, it is uh, the the cost of access and data is less and less uh, a barrier. So. For scientists in, in Africa, for scientists in, in uh, countries with uh, less resources, it's um, as, as long as you have a, a good um, internet connection um, and, and we uh, like, uh, like the Copernicus program, which is all uh, open access data, um, that, that really um, strengthens the scientific community or actually, actually helps uh, researchers without big resources to do their research, and this is something which obviously uh, Cloud Ferro is a is a is a private company here, so that's probably not something that has been emphasized here because you obviously um, emphasize the, the technological challenges and 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 the opportunities, and they are they are huge, but I mean they are always huge. Uh, I mean they were huge if you had asked. Um, a computer science uh, person 10 years ago, or you will ask a computer science person in 10 years. Uh, I mean, technology is always new and exciting and, and is, is growing and fast developing. But again, there are some like paradigm shifts in society that we now really see happen based on, on not only the Earth's observation information itself, but on the access, on now on this wide access to Earth observation, being made available through these cloud-based infrastructures. Thank you very much. Thank you very mu much, uh, Thomas. Uh, this, uh, I think this was very interesting. Uh, I know we, ha we are uh, behind the time and I know uh, many of you have to leave. Uh, I would. I think uh, we will uh, skip the Q and A session uh, for this reason, unless someone uh, wants to stay with us uh, beyond the the end of the webinar. We will be, of course, be happy to um, uh, to answer. Uh, 
Uh, I would just uh, I would just uh, advertise a few upcoming events. There is Digital Earth uh, organized by uh, University of Salzburg by, by Thomas, and uh, we think it, it will be a great event to uh, to attend. Uh, there are a few webinars uh, that will that we organize that that are coming. You will receive all this information uh, with the slides uh, that will be available uh, for all of you uh, to to uh, use. Um, so, uh, so I would like to thank uh, Thomas and uh, Daniel. It was really uh, great to have you uh, in that uh, webinar. I would like to thank uh, all the participants. Uh, it was great to uh, to have you and welcome to um, uh, to our following webinars uh, and of course uh, we stay with you for the Q&A yes uh, I have got one question from the uh, from the the audience that came to me through the chat uh, that was about uh, how to avoid multi-step pipelines at architecture level and, and uh, as an example of, uh, of course, uh, in a generic way, uh, it may be difficult, but uh, there are situations where you can really uh, avoid it. And one example would be um, uh, the organization of a storage system that is uh, meant to deliver data to a user. So uh, if on one extreme you have a tape-based uh, long-term archive, in order to process data from that archive, you need to order data from the, uh, from the uh, tape library. The tape library needs to, uh, to make it available in a, uh, through a temporary uh, data storage area. The data needs to be decompressed, uh, transferred to the user, and then, uh, or transferred, decompressed, and then processed. On the other hand, if you make that same data, if it, this data is reasonably often used, if you store that data in directly access, uh, accessible, uncompressed form, accessible through something like NFS, uh, or a file system mounted uh, an object uh, an object storage mounted via a file system it avoids the, all the steps that need to be uh, performed in order to process access and process that that data so this is just an example uh, many other examples could probably be given but by, by uh, others okay we could, if you have some questions on the, I don't see questions, uh, new questions appearing on the chat. If you have any, uh, please uh, come to us and uh, we will answer them uh, uh, offline. You are generally welcome to uh, contact us and uh, uh, to, uh, to ask things. <laughs> Thank you once again, uh, Thomas and Daniel, for this uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it was uh, it was great to uh, be with you. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you for the invitation. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.